Well, good morning, Grace Fellowship. That's exciting news, isn't it? We're getting to build a children's building. It's very awesome. Our kids are excited. We're excited. And uh, we officially voted last Sunday afternoon to go forward with this project. The monies are coming in, and this is very, very exciting. We want to do a unique groundbreaking ceremony for that. Since we're building the children's building, we want the children to break ground. And so um, today after the service, if, when you go pick up your kids in elementary and younger, uh, they're going to have gotten a flower pot. And I invite you to go out onto the land, uh, kind of in front towards us, and, the, and there's a pile of dirt there. And we, we, we want you to break ground, take some of that dirt, put it in the pot, plant some seeds that they have given you, and watch a plant grow as the children's building uh, grows. So anybody can go do that. Uh, but we especially want parents and children to do that together as a formal way of breaking ground uh, on, on this project. Uh, a couple other things before we dive into the message. Inside your bulletin is this picture of a girl praying. Will you look at that with me real quick? Um, Ten days from now is the National Day of Prayer, and we're going to celebrate that as a city uh, at the Merrill Center. Uh, we predict that 4,000 people are going to show up to the Merrill Center from all the different churches in West Houston uh, to pray together for our country. And uh, so will you let this little girl motivate you to pray and, uh, and come out to the Merrill Center? I, I want to invite you. Actually, I want to ask you. Uh, I think this is an important role that we have in praying for our nation and for our city. So please come. A week from Thursday, uh, May the 3rd, 7 p.m. I uh, hope to see you there. And then... Um, Look with me on the back side of your sermon notes. So if you'll take your sermon notes out, look on the back side. I want to give you a heads up to what this summer is going to look like. Um, Grace Fellowship is very gracious. The leadership of this church allows me once every seven years to take a sabbatical. And so uh, this is a time for my sabbatical again. It's been seven years. And uh, so this summer, I'm going to take a sabbatical. And, uh, and so I just want you to see what good hands you're going to be in. You're going to be in great hands uh, with Mitch Pearson and Brian Owen leading us leadership-wise. And then in terms of the preaching menu, uh, you're going to be in really great hands. Uh, matter of fact, I, I hope you want me back after you hear all these different preachers that you're going to hear uh, this summer. So let me just kind of walk you through this menu so you know what's coming up uh, in, in the spiritual menu. So my first Sunday gone uh, will be May 13th. And Ben Stewart is going to be here. Ben Stewart uh, leads an amazing Bible study in College Station. Uh, 4,000 students show up every Tuesday night. Uh, they fill up ha uh, half of a basketball coliseum to do Bible study. Uh, and God has really anointed this guy. You're going to love Ben Stewart. He's going to finish up the book of Job for us. May the 20th, my good friend Ken Werlein, who's a pastor of one of the great churches here in Houston called Faith Bridge, uh, is going to be here. You're going to love uh, him. May 27th, Falu is going to be here. Falu is a Nigerian pastor here in Katy. Falu is awesome. I could listen to Falu talk for 10 hours straight. Uh, I love listening to his accent, but more than that, he has an amazing depth and passion uh, that you're going to really, really uh, love. Then the month of June, Paul Helbig, our own Paul Helbig, a professor here at the Bible Seminary, is going to walk us through the book of Ruth, one chapter of Ruth per Sunday in the month of June. Then in the month of July, uh, typically here at Grace Fellowship, we call that Family Sundays. So we actually shut down our children's ministry in July. The children join us in here. There are two reasons for that. It gives our children's ministry a break. And uh, we think it's cool to worship together as families uh, for several Sundays. And so uh, the five Sundays in July, we'll worship all together in here. Uh, the first Sunday in July is the chalk guy. Those services will be identical. We love the chalk guy. Uh, look at those chalk drawings on this wall out in the lobby, and you'll get a taste of him. Uh, the last Sunday in July is a guy named Dennis Rogers. Uh, he's one of the st strongest guys in the world, and he doesn't look like it. Um, and they've studied his body to figure out why he's so strong. So he's going to do some cool feats for us and then use that to share scripture and the gospel uh, with us. That's the first Sunday and the last Sunday of July. Those three middle Sundays in July, uh, you've got two options every single Sunday. So those three middle Sundays in July, if you come to the first service, you're going to get a normal Grace Fellowship worship service with uh, a Grace Fellowship pastor preaching. If you come to the second service, the 1045 service, in one of those three middle Sundays in July, then uh, you're going to get a very kid-driven uh, type uh, event, whether it's a, 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 a jump rope champion that's going to share scripture while he jump ropes and just does amazing things. Those kind of things uh, I think uh, you'll really enjoy. So that's what's coming up, and just want you to uh, be aware of that, and I hope you'll actually want me back uh, uh, at the end of the summer. So, All right, let's dive into God's Word uh, together. Uh, take out those sermon notes, grab a pen, uh, open your Bible to Job chapter 3. 
Uh, Job is in the Old Testament. It's about one third of the way through your Bible. It comes right before the book of Psalms. Job chapter three. Uh, our sermon today from the book of Job is about how to not counsel hurting people. You ever wonder, okay, what do I say to people uh, who are hurting, suffering? Well, I want to teach you today what not to do. Whenever I think about the subject, I always remember that old Geico commercial. Matter of fact, we got the right here. Watch this. Could switching to Geico really save you 15% or more on car insurance? Does a former drill sergeant make a terrible therapist? And that's why yellow makes me sad, I think. That's interesting. You know what makes me sad? You do! Maybe we should chug on over to Mamby Pamby land where maybe we can find some self-confidence for you, you jack wagon. Tissue. Cry, baby. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. I could summarize the whole message this morning with that commercial. Uh, this drill sergeant could get along just really, really well with Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, who we're going to meet today in the book of Job. Uh, look at the outline of the book of Job uh, that I put there in your sermon notes. The book of Job can be divided really nicely into three major sections. You've got the disasters of Job in the first two chapters. You've got the dialogues with Job, in all, this is the main part of Job in the middle section. And then the very last chapter is uh, the deliverance of Job. So uh, for the last two weeks, we've looked at the disasters of Job, uh, chapters one and chapter two. Uh, for today and for the next two Sundays, we're going to look at the dialogues with Job. And then ben, ben Stewart will wrap it up for us with the deliverance uh, of Job. So today we're going to be looking at the dialogue with Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar in Job chapter 3 through 31. So check it out. We're going to cover 29 chapters of Scripture today in one short little sermon. <laughs> uh, we can do it. Uh, and you're going to be glad that we're compacting all of that because these are miserable chapters. Uh, just to be honest, they're miserable chapters, but there's something to learn uh, from these scriptures. Um, so let's say a prayer and then let's dive into these scriptures together. Pray with me, please. And would you begin just by saying a prayer for yourself? Would you open yourself up to hear from God in his word? Tell God you want to hear from him. And then if you don't mind, would you say a short prayer for me that I could speak God's word clearly to us? Well, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. Will you teach us how to deal with people in our lives who are suffering and hurting and depressed? Teach us, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, here we go, Job chapter three. Let's actually back up to the end of chapter two. Job chapter two, starting in verse 11. Verse 11. When Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Namathite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon Job. These three friends set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with Job and comfort him. When they saw Job from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with Job for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to Job because they saw how great his suffering was. Chapter three. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And what follows is 29 chapters of Job talking and then his friends dialoguing with him and talking to him. And then Job talks some more and his friends dialoguing with him some more uh, back and forth and back and forth. Let me give you the interpretive key to all that we're gonna to read today. Uh, look with me at chapter 42. So go to the very last chapter of Job. Job chapter 42. And let me show you the interpretive key to Job chapter three through 31. An interpretive key is, is, is one verse of scripture that unlocks the rest of them. This one verse of scripture that I'm gonna share with you and show you right now is gonna help you understand 29 chapters of scripture uh, previous uh, to it. So look at Job chapter 42, uh, verse seven. Verse seven, here it is. After the Lord had said these things to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. 
This is key. God's commentary on everything that the three friends say is this. I put this in your notes. Everything they have said is wrong. (laughs) That's the first fill in the blank there. Everything that these three friends say to Job in chapters 3 through 31 is wrong. That's a pretty crucial piece of information to understand uh, if you're going to understand uh, these chapters. Uh, Look again at verse 7 just to make sure we, we catch it. Job chapter 42, verse 7. After the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz, I am angry with you and your two friends because the three of you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Everything these three friends say in chapters 3 through 31 is wrong. Now, flip back to chapter 16 for another interpretive key. Job chapter 16. So if we could walk up to Job and say, hey Job, how did your three friends do at comforting you? How did your three friends do at helping you when you were suffering? He's going to tell us in chapter 16. Job chapter 16 verses 1 through 3 is another interpretive key because Job is telling us whether or not what his friends shared with him is helpful. Chapter 16 verse 1. Then Job replied, I have heard many things like these. Miserable comforters are you all. (laughs) Will your long-winded speeches never end? What ails you that you keep on arguing? I mean, what Job's friends shared with him in these 29 chapters was not helpful. It was miserable comfort. It was not helpful. So put all this together and conclude with me this next sentence I put in your notes. Everything that Job's three friends share in chapters 3 through 31 is an example of how not to counsel a hurting person. That's what we're going to learn today. That everything in these 29 chapters is an example of how not to counsel a hurting person. So what I'd like to do with you in our Bible study this morning is give you a a seminary crash course uh, on how uh, to not counsel uh, hurting people. And, uh, and the Bible's going to train you on how to minister to hurting people by beginning with how not to do it. So here we go. Look at your notes. How to not counsel hurting people. Number one, don't tell people that their suffering is a result of their sin. Don't tell people that their suffering is a result of their sin. Flip back to chapter four. Job chapter four. Overwhelmingly, <laughs> In fact, if I could summarize 90% of these 29 chapters, it's Job's three friends telling him, the reason all this stuff happened to you is because you sinned. Let's look at several examples. Chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. This is the first friend, Eliphaz, talking to Job. Verse 7. Job, consider now, who being innocent has ever perished? Where were the upright ever destroyed? As I have observed, those who plow evil... And those who sow trouble, reap it. Job, all the suffering you're going through right now is you reaping evil seeds that you have sown. Flip over to chapter 8. Job chapter 8. We're doing Bible sword drills this morning. Uh, I'm going to exercise your wrists. Job chapter 8, starting in verse 1. This is the second friend, Bildad. And remember, Job has just lost all of his possessions all of his children have died, and he's, he's lost his health. Look at what his second friend, Bildad, says to him. Verse 2, Bildad to Job. Hey, Job, how long will you say such things? Your words are a blustering wind. Does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? When your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. The reason your ten children died is because they sinned. And he just goes on and on and on. Look at verse 13. Uh, Verse 13 is a summary verse. Such is the destiny. All these bad things I just said is the destiny of all who forget God. So perishes the hope of the godless. Job, the reason all this is happening to you is because you've forgotten God and you are a godless person. How do you like to have these guys for your friend? (laughs) Flip over to chapter 20. Job chapter 20. The third friend is going to speak up now. Job chapter 20, starting in verse 4. Zophar, talking to Job, says, Job, verse 4, 
Surely you know how it has been from of old, ever since man was placed on the earth, that the mirth of the wicked is brief, the joy of the godless lasts but a moment. Though his pride reaches to the heavens and his head touches the clouds, the wicked will perish forever like his own dung. <laughs> Job, what is happening to you is, 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 is like your own dung. And then look at verse 29. This guy just goes on and on and on. But summary verse, uh, verse 29, he lists all the bad things that are gonna happen to the wicked. And verse 29, he says, such is the fate that God allots the wicked the heritage appointed for them by God. All this is happening to you, Job, because you are evil. Now flip over to ch chapter 22. Job chapter 22. I'm giving you the cliff notes here. There's 29 chapters of this stuff. Uh, chapter uh, 22, verse 5. This is the first friend, Eliphaz, again. Look what he says in verse 5. Talking to Job, he says, Job, is not your wickedness great? Are not your sins endless? You demanded security, uh, a pledge, from your brothers for no reason. You stripped men of their clothing, leaving them naked. You gave no water to the weary, and you withheld food from the hungry, though you were a powerful man owning land, an honored man living on it. And you sent widows away empty-handed. You broke the strength of the fatherless. That is why snares are all around you, why sudden peril terrifies you, why it's so dark that you cannot see, and why a flood of water covers you, because of all the evil that you've done. These accusations about Job are not true. As we read the, the fullness of these 29 chapters, we find that Job did minister to the poor well. He did feed the orphan and the widow and took care uh, of them. But Eliphaz, trying to find some explanation of Job's misery and suffering, turns to theology, and it's false theology. God makes it clear throughout the book of Job that Job's suffering is not a result of his personal sin. So learn a lesson from the book of Job. When you encounter people who are suffering, don't tell them they're suffering because of their sin or their lack of faith. All right, number two. We're learning how, to, how not to counsel somebody when they're hurting. Number two, don't tell people not to be angry. It's the next fill in the blank there. Don't tell people not to be angry. Uh, flip to chapter 15. Job chapter 15. Again, Job's friends are a bad example. They're an example of how not to talk to people. <laughs> uh, chapter 15, verse 12. This is Eliphaz again, the first friend. Eliphaz says to Job in verse 12, Job, why has your heart carried you away and why do your eyes flash anger? so that you vent your rage against God and pour out such words from your mouth. In other words, Job, quit talking to God the way that you've been talking to him in anger. Then flip over to chapter 18. Job chapter 18. This is Bill Dad, the second friend. He says something very similar. <clears throat> verse four, actually back up to verse two. Uh, Bill Dad's talking to Job, says, Job, when will you end these speeches? Be sensible, and then we can talk. Why are we, your friends, regarded as cattle and considered stupid in your sight? Well, <laughs> verse four. Job, you who tear yourself to pieces in your anger, is the earth to be abandoned for your sake, or must the rocks be moved from their place? Job, don't be angry. Quit talking to God in anger like this. Grace Fellowship, don't tell people that. The Bible is really clear that it's okay to express your anger to God. L look at the scriptures I put there in your notes. David expresses his anger to God. David, a man after God's own heart, says this in Psalm 10 when he's suffering. David says, why, O Lord, why do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? David in Psalm 13 when he's suffering says, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And David in Psalm 22 says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where are you? It's okay to express your anger to God. It's okay to grieve. Jesus did. Remember the account in John chapter 11 uh, when Jesus arrives on the scene and Lazarus has died and he sees Mary and Martha. What does he do? John 11 says Jesus wept. 
Jesus wept. Listen, Grace Fellowship, if it's okay for the Son of God to grieve, then it's okay for you and it's okay for me uh, to grieve. Look at what um, Granger Westberg uh, says in his book, Good Grief. He says, grief is a natural part of human experience. To say a person is deeply spiritual and therefore does not have to face grief situations is, is just ridiculous. Not only is it totally unrealistic, but it's also incompatible with the whole Christian message. The Bible encourages us to grieve. And as we grieve, there's certain stages that we would go through uh, as we grieve, uh, when, we're, when we've lost somebody or we're hurting. Uh, look at the stages of grief in your notes. Uh, after you lose somebody, you go through denial and you say, this isn't happening to me. And then you go through anger. Why is this happening to me? And then you go through bargaining. I promise I'll be a better person if you just... And then you go through depression. I just don't care anymore. And finally, after going through those stages, you can arrive at acceptance. So Grace Fellowship, don't try to stop somebody through going through these stages of grief. Rather, sit with them as they go through their grief in these stages. All right, number three. Don't tell people that they just need to endure God's discipline. I'll let you look that one up on your own. Number four, don't tell people to turn back to God. That's the next fill in the blank. Don't tell people to turn back to God and that everything will be okay. Flip over to chapter 11. Job chapter 11. Job chapter 11, starting in verse 13. And remember, in chapter 42, God tells us that everything that these three friends have said is wrong, including what we're about to read. Job chapter 11, verse 13. This is Zophar, the second friend, talking to Job. Job uh, Zophar says, Job, if you will devote your heart to God and if you'll stretch out your hands to God and if you'll put away the sin that is in your hand and allow no evil to dwell in your tent, then you will lift up your face without shame and you will stand firm and without fear. You will surely forget your trouble, recalling it's only as water has gone by. Life will be brighter than noonday and darkness will become like morning. Then flip over to chapter 22, Job chapter 22. Starting in verse five. This is the first friend, Eliphaz. Remember, God told Eliphaz, what you said of me is wrong. Verse five. No, I'm sorry, verse 21. Verse 21. Eliphaz says to Job in verse 21, Job, submit to God and be at peace with him. In this way, prosperity will come to you. Accept instruction from God's mouth and lay up God's words in your heart if you return to the Almighty, you will be restored. Listen, Grace Fellowship, when somebody in your life is hurting, don't look at them and say, let go and let God. Don't say that. I know you're trying to help, but saying those words when somebody is hurting is not helpful. Now listen, let me be clear. Of course, we all need to let go and let God. That is a true truth. We all need to let go and let God. It's just, that's not what you say to somebody in the middle of their misery and suffering. All right, number four, or number five. We're learning how not to counsel hurting people. Number five, don't tell people that God is sovereign and in control. Don't tell people that God is sovereign and in control. Now listen up. Of course God is sovereign and in control. Of course he is. God is sovereign and he is in control. But we don't need to preach that to people in the middle of their suffering. How do I know we're not supposed to do that? Because in Job chapter 42 verse 7, God says everything that these three friends did was wrong. That's how we know. So look at, I think we're still in chapter 22. Look at verse 12. Look at the three friends approach in verse 12. God says it's wrong. Eliphaz says, verse 12, Is not God in the heights of heaven? And see how lofty are the highest stars. That's a true truth. God is in heaven. 
But you're not supposed to tell somebody that in the midst of their suffering. Flip over to chapter 25. Now is not the time to say that. Chapter 25. This is Bill Dad. Verse 1. Job chapter 25, verse 1. Then Bill Dad, talking to Job, says, Dominion and awe belong to God. He establishes order in the heights of heaven. Can his forces be numbered? Upon whom does his light not rise? Listen, God is awesome. God is sovereign. He is in control. Yes, he is. But that's not what you say to somebody in the midst of their suffering and pain. Lastly, number six. When somebody's hurting, don't tell them that they just need to believe God for a miracle. That's the next fill in the blank there. When somebody's hurting, don't tell them that they just need to believe God for a miracle. Flip back to chapter five. Job chapter five. We're covering 29 chapters. Chapter five, verse eight. This is Eliphaz, the first friend, talking to Job. He says, Job, if I were you, I would appeal to God. I would lay my cause before him because God performs wonders that cannot be fathomed. God performs miracles that cannot be uh, counted. Just believe God for a miracle and he will deliver you from all of this, Job. Listen, Grace Fellowship, I believe in miracles. I believe in miracles. I believe in miracles. But this is not the statement you make to somebody in the midst of their hurting and their depression and their suffering. When they've just lost a child, this is not the statement that you make to them. When somebody has had something devastating happen to them, I do not recommend whipping out your Grace Fellowship Easter CD and playing this song. Don't play this. I love that song. I loved jamming and worship to that song on Easter morning. But that's not the song you play for somebody who's just lost a loved one. The Bible says it this way. Don't sing songs to a heavy heart. Look at the scripture I put in your notes. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 20. This is a great scripture. Put a star next to it. Proverbs 25, 20 says this. Like one who takes away a garment on a cold day, or like vinegar poured on soda, is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. Look at it again. Just let this soak in. Like somebody who takes a coat away from somebody on a freezing day, or like vinegar poured on soda, is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. Now, the chemical engineer nerd in me couldn't help but resist to demonstrate the scripture to us. So I've got some vinegar and some soda for you to do a little science experiment with us uh, this morning. What happens when you pour uh, vinegar on soda? So I'm putting baking soda in this glass. And now we're going to pour some vinegar into the glass. So Here's you or me trying to sing songs to somebody who just lost a loved one, who's in the midst of depression, who is suffering right now. What happens when you sing songs to this person? Well, this is what happens right here. It just, it agitates. It causes this violent reaction to go on inside you. And here comes a praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. It's just, this does not minister to somebody when they're hurting. <laughs> you want to know what the chemical reaction that's going on here is? I thought you'd want to know that. I got a slide that uh, shows us what the chemical reaction is uh, right here. 
So when you mix vinegar and baking soda, there on the left there is the vinegar, uh, which is acidic acid. And the, the next uh, formula there is that for sodium bicarbonate. When you mix those two, there's a chemical reaction which occurs that makes sodium acetate and carbonic acid. On the far right is carbonic acid. Now carbonic acid is an unstable compound. So next formula, it immediately uh, begins breaking apart, uh, the carbonic acid does, into water and into carbon dioxide. And so what you see fizzing up there is the carbon dioxide, which is how a person feels. That is how a person feels when you sing songs to them uh, when they're miserable. Don't do that, Grace Fellowship. Don't do that. God is a chemical engineer. Did you know it? God is a chemical engineer. <laughs> the point is, don't do it. Don't sing songs to a heavy heart, or you will cause a negative displacement, displacement reaction. Uh, to go off inside the other person. Let me close this section with uh, 16 things to not say to somebody who's hurting. I'm just trying to get as practical as I can. Uh, we so much want to say the right things to people uh, when they're hurting. Well, we gotta, we got to strip our vocabulary of, of these things right here. So here's 16 things not to say when somebody's hurting. Uh, number one, don't say this. I know how you feel. Don't say it. Uh, God will never give you more than you can handle. Don't say that. Time heals all wounds. Don't say that. You have so much to be thankful for. That's a true truth. But now's not the time to say that. Say it to yourself. <laughs> Number five. At least he's not suffering anymore. That's a true truth. But now's not the time to say that. Number six. God needed him more than you did. Don't say that. Number seven. God needed another angel in heaven. Don't say that. She's in a better place now. That is a true truth. But they don't need to hear that right now. Number nine, you can have another child. That's not helpful. Number 10, now that your husband is gone, you should consider getting a dog. They are wonderful companions. I'm just, that's just not helpful. I'm telling you, people say that. Number 11, it's time to move on. Uh, don't, don't say that. How are you... How are you going to spend the insurance money? Please don't say that. I list that here because some people have said that. Don't say that. Was he a believer? That's an important question. But don't ask that question. Number 14. Be grateful that you had her for so long. Don't say that. Number 15. God will bring good out of this. Romans 8.28. Romans 8.28 is a true truth. It's scripture. It's true. But now is not the time to say that. Say it to yourself. Number 16, give thanks in all circumstances. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 is a true truth. I invite you to live by that. But I don't invite you to preach that to somebody who's in the midst of suffering. All right, I think you get the point. You got the point? Uh, I think we killed this one. I'm teaching you what not to say. But many of you are saying, okay, Jim, I get it. But now teach me something to say. What, what, what do I do? All right, let's talk about that. That's the next section uh, there in your notes. So look with me in your notes. Uh, correct ways, correct ways to minister to hurting people. Three pieces of advice from the Bible. Number one, give hurting people the ministry of presence. Not open up gifts presence, the CE ending. Uh, give, give hurting people the ministry of presence presence. So you ask, Jim, what should I say to hurting people? And my answer is you don't need to say anything. You don't need to say anything. Rather, give them your presence. Be present with them. Let God use your presence to minister to the hurting person. Just be there with them. Listen to what uh, Kenneth Hawk the founder of Stephen Ministry says, he says, over and over, those who have suffered reported presence alone as a powerful caring force. The human presence of, of the one caring and relating is called incarnational ministry. Even when you don't mention the name of Jesus, Jesus is still there living inside of you, reaching out. A human presence makes God's presence seem very near instead of far away. When you don't, want to, when you don't know what to say, Try saying nothing. Just let your quiet presence be the powerful witness to your love. 
Your presence is worth much, much more than words. Your presence communicates to the other that he or she is valued, precious, beloved. Your presence brings not only the gift of yourself, but also in and through you, it brings the gift of God. And so I commend to you application number one there in your notes. The next time you encounter somebody who's hurting, seek to just be with them without having to say anything. Silently pray that God will use your presence to minister his presence. Listen to the testimonies of some hurting people who received the ministry of presence. This one woman who was 25 years old when her mother died said this. She said, I don't remember anything they said, only their presence and their prayers. Another suffering person said, when people came and were just present for me, they were a gift. I felt love, compassion, and acceptance of the fact that I preferred silence over small talk. I was able to be lost in my own thoughts, yet not alone. They helped make a sad time a little more bearable. And one other suffering person said, their being with me helped me to remember that I'm never really alone because God is always with me. A human presence makes God seem very near instead of far away. All right, number two. What is the correct way to minister to a hurting person? Number two, mourn with them. Mourn with them. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Listen to what Kenneth Hawk says on this. He says, empathy means feeling with. Hurting people need caregivers who will match their mood to a certain extent. Laugh with them when they feel like laughing or cry when they feel like crying. Remember how Jesus wept with Mary and Martha at the tomb of Lazarus? Christians who mourn with those who mourn are following the pattern of Jesus Christ and incarnating his love to the hurting. And so application number two, the next time you encounter a hurting person, do not run away from them. Oh, please, do not run away from them. I know it's awkward, but press into them. And don't try to cheer them up. Rather, enter into their grief with them. Hurt with them. Mourn with them. I highly recommend to you a class that we have here at Grace Fellowship called Grief Share. If, if you've lost somebody in your life, go to Grief Share. Uh, Scott and Vicki, come on up here. Scott and Vicki Sales have agreed to share their story uh, with us uh, this morning. Would you welcome uh, Scott and Vicki Sales with me? Good morning. Jim asked if we would share our testimony with you because we, like Job, have experienced suffering. September 16, 2006, Scott and I were out working in the yard doing some normal maintenance around um, the yard. It was a Saturday, and we were listening to the University of Michigan Notre Dame football game. We're big U of M fans, and uh, they were winning. Yay! <laughs> um, our son, Nicholas, is a huge University of Michigan football fan, and I knew that he was um, listening to the game as well. And I, I wanted to call him and say, your team won, but I decided against. I thought, well, he's probably busy, so I won't call him. The phone rang. Scott and I were sitting at the dinner table, finishing up our meal, and we played our little game. <laughs> It's not for me. It's not for me. And so neither one of us got up to answer the phone. Instead, we um, let the answer machine pick it up. The voice on the answer machine was nearly unrecognizable. It was our son's father-in-law. And by the sound of his voice, something bad had happened, and it was really, really bad. So instead of picking up the phone, uh, we reached for my cell phone, and Scott called him back. And I stood in front of Scott, and I'm just, I'm begging him and pleading with him, tell me, tell me, tell me, what, what is it, what is it, what is it, what is it? I watched the color drain from his face. He pulled the phone away from his ear long enough to say, Nick's dead. Nicholas was at a bachelor's party in Atlantic City, New Jersey, um, celebrating the upcoming marriage of one of his high school buddies. 
uh, they were at a hotel. They were in a hallway, the end of the hallway in, in a hotel. And they were planning their, their next activity. And they were just having a lot of fun, messing around. And one of his friends went to embrace Nick. And they lost their balance. They fell against a window at the end of the hallway. The window broke. The two boys fell through the window, fell four floors to the ground. Nick fell first. The friend fell on top of Nick. Nick died. The friend lived. Nick was 27 years old. He had been married a little over two years. He was eight months away from completing dual degrees in medicine and law. He was just a highly motivated young man. He was going to do a residency in pediatric orth orthopedics. He absolutely loved and adored children. Gone. All gone. I went running around the house looking for him. Scott was still on the phone. Even though Nick was in New Jersey and I was in Texas, I just, I had to find him. I came to a place in the kitchen, just confused not understanding really what had happened. And I stopped at a place in the kitchen. And there before me was a vision of Jesus holding Nick. I knew right then where he was. He was safe. And it was going to be okay. I felt indescribable comfort. Scott was trying to reach um, family. Our families um, reside out of state. We're here alone. And still not knowing what to do, wandering around the house, I went back into the kitchen again, that same place. And God was waiting for me again. He said to me, he said to my soul, you have no regrets. I knew how much God, or I knew how much Nick loved me, and I knew how much I loved him. And now it was revealed to me on how much God loved me. He knew what I needed right at that moment. He, needed to, he knew that I needed to know about my baby and to help my heart heal. One of the phone calls that we made um, was to David Couch. He, at the time, was the leader of our home group. And not knowing what to do, I just I needed to tell David that, that our son had died. David said, I'm coming over. So a little while later, I opened up the front door, and there were six members of our home group standing there, and they looked like angels. They were actually Jesus with skin on. They came in, they stayed with us until the early morning hours of that day, and they prayed with us, they talked with us, they cried with us, they asked to see pictures of Nick. I can't even tell you how that touched my heart when one of them asked to see pictures. They helped us, those first moments that we were experiencing in, in our loss. The next day we went to um, New Jersey. We had to plan a service to say goodbye and to celebrate Nick's life. Scott and I both um, chose to speak at the, the ceremony, or the service for Nick. I don't like to call it um, a funeral. It's a remembrance and a celebration. And S Scott told everyone that it was going to be okay, that we would see Nick again in heaven someday. And he also said to hug your children. Then I spoke. I wanted people to know about my Nick from an early age on, so I shared mom's stories, um, stories that, um, that only I could know. And people laughed through tears, and they said to me later that they could feel the agony just slipping away. Healing needed to begin with us. Scott and I knew that. People were looking at us to see how we were coping. And Scott said, we need to help those boys. We need to help those boys that witness Nick's death. We need to make sure they're going to be okay. After we got home, we'd been home for a couple months, and I got a call from Deanna Durden, who was one of the co-leaders with the Grief Share program at that time. And she encouraged me to come, and I thought, I don't need to come. I'm okay. I'm all right. I'm okay. I wasn't okay. And I went to Grief Share and helped me so much, helped me to understand that, that God loves me and he's not going to leave me on a street corner. He's not going to say, I'm done with you. i got to go help someone else. No. He has been there with us all along. After I completed Grief Share, 
I was asking God, well, God, what do I do with Nick's death? I don't know what to do with his death. And so he started revealing to me what he wanted me to do. And what it was is he wanted me to become a co-leader for the Grief Share program. And I kept resisting, telling him, no, God, I can't do that. I'm too shy. I can't do that. But he kept placing people in front of me, and he um, would, people would call, people would email, unbeknownst to each other. And then the, the final nudging was from Jim, unbeknownst to Jim. Um, it was November 4, 2007, and his sermon topic was Suburban Legends, and it was Suburban Legends number eight, Less Suffering Will Make Me Happier. And one of the last... Uh, items on uh, Jim's notes was a quote from Rick Warren, and Rick states, God never wastes a hurt. In fact, your greatest ministry will most likely come from your greatest hurt. In fact, even at the end, I wrote, amen. I'd carried this around in my Bible for a long time. Um, it's pretty dog-eared and finally took it out and filed it away in a safe place. Scott and I were quiet after that. We were leaving church that morning, and we got outside, and he says to me, well, you're going to do it? <laughs> and I said, I don't know how I can tell God no. So I became a, a co-leader with Grief Share. There are times that I feel so inadequate in doing God's work. And then he sends me a message. This is what I want you to do. It, it, it's intense. It, it is, it's really intense. But the rewards are there when you witness people progressing from the first session to the last session. And all I can say is, yay, God. There have been so many people who have been willing to walk with us from day one. Our home group, the care ministry, my Bible study the men's morning prayer breakfast on Tuesdays at Cracker Barrel. All of these people have just been so wonderful and just allowing us to talk, encouraging us, loving us, hugging us, just amazing. We, we are so blessed. We are just so blessed. Jim talked about what not to say to a grieving person, and um, it brought to my heart um, something that someone said to me um, after Nick's service. She said to me, well, now your daughter's an only child. At the time, I, I knew what she was saying wasn't right, but I was in the midst of shock and grief and just could not digest it. Well, it was a short while later, I thought, my daughter's not an only child. I have two children. We have two children. We have a daughter who makes her home in New Jersey, and we have a son who makes his home in heaven. And now we have a grandson, too. Scott would tell people, people would struggle, we don't know what to say. And he would say, it's okay, there are no words, and there aren't. And I would tell people, I just need a hug. And if you just pray for us, that, that's the most and best thing that you can do for us. The first time Scott and I stood together like this was at Nick's service, and we talked about Nick and celebrated our son. Today we stand together before you and we celebrate and glorify and love on God. It's amazing when I look back from day one to today where we are, and it's only by the grace and love of God that we are here. He has walked with us. He's picked us up off the floor. He's captured all our tears. He's listened endlessly when we called out. He has never left our sides. He's revealed his glory to us beyond imagination. We've seen rainbows when there's not been a drop of rain. There have been moments where we'll say, God, we just need a butterfly. And I'm telling you, he sends a butterfly. And he even sends eagles. Like Job, we have never cursed God. We have never gotten angry with God, with God. And I personally have not ever asked why. God did not push our son through that window. Jesus caught Nick before his body hit the ground and broke and took him home and uses him for his glory over and over and over. There were so many times where we would try to lay the burden of Nick's ashes down at the cross and we kept picking them up. We just didn't want to let go. Kept trying to pick them up and, and just carry them and it was so heavy. But through the transformation of our hearts, 
and the love of God, we were able to lay those ashes down. We don't see the ashes anymore. What we see is the cross. God gave us such a beautiful gift in our children. He chose us to be their parents. And who are we that God would choose us to be parents to Nick and Molly and to be grandparents to Henry Nicholas? There was a time right after Nick had died, I wanted to see him so bad. I wanted, I, I wanted to see him. His death was tragic. He was in New Jersey. I was in Texas. I just wanted to see him. And I would go to bed at night and I would say, okay, God, I want to go to sleep now and I want to wake up in heaven. Thank you. I love you. Good night. And I said that several times and I'd wake up and I went, well, not today. I'm still here. Then I stopped asking. And now, what Scott and I look forward to is the day that we will meet Jesus face to face and we will fall on our knees in thanksgiving and love. And then we will see Nick. It's going to be a glorious day. This year, um, we celebrate Nick's birthday, December 12th, 2012, 12, 12, 12. Nick would have loved it. He would have played with it all year. We would have heard about it endlessly. Um, and 12, even before all of this, just happened to be Scott's number. There were 12 um, uh, apostles. And I'm sure there's 12 in engineering somewhere. I don't know. But um, on, his, on his truck, the inspection sticker and the registration is 1212. Now, I didn't make that happen. That's got to be a God thing. Again, we experience great sadness and we experience great joy. And through all this, we have not lost our joy. We have good days and we have sad days. And on those sad days, God is right there with us. He is walking with us and he is taking us into the next day. And it's a new day. One of the things that Nick and I shared was such a closeness. I knew he loved me, and he knew I loved him. And no matter the conversation situation, we always said, I love you. So one of the things that I shared at Nick's service was to remind people to always say, I love you. I asked Jesus to tell my Nick how much I love him, how much I miss him, and how much I can't wait to see him again someday when God calls me home and we will have our reunion day. I say it a lot. And I know Jesus goes to him and says, Nick, I have a message for you from your mom. I know he does that. I say I love you to God and to Jesus so many, many times during my day, no matter the conversation or situation, it flows from my heart so freely. By the grace and love of God, I can go on loving. Remember to always say I love you and remember to hug your children. And like Job, we have been restored. God bless you.